uh, second talk of today. Um, at, at BCBT, uh, and, and I think it was the third or the fourth year, maybe the third year of BCBT, we decided that all this talk of cognition and consciousness was, was great, but we were missing something which was to really understand uh, the origins of uh, where we come from, where we brains, our brains come from, why our brains are the way that they are, we are, they are. And we thought that you know, maybe exploring a little bit more the evolution and the development of the brain and cognition would be a good way of getting a, a grasp on the questions that we're trying to answer at BCBT. Uh, even these high-level questions about the nature of self and the nature of consciousness. So um, at that point, we looked around and said, well, we don't know much about evolution and development. Well, who does? And uh, uh, we found a, a web page for somebody who had been over the whole world and had looked at uh, all kinds of brains from many, many different animals, you know, even rare, obscure ones like uh, Australian marsupials. And we thought, this person really knows about the brain and about the, the range and variance of different brains and what they might do. And the, and the great thing about this person was that she also explored how uh, the brains of these animals gives rise to behavior. And that person was Leah Krubetzer. And Leah, uh, I think, took our, our invitation to come to the summer school because it was Barcelona, you know, to be honest. I think that's why she came. Uh, and, you know, she, she had heard about the food and the drink here. And, and the, and the nightlife, and, and so she came not expecting too much from the summer school. But I think we surprised her uh, with uh, how intellectually in exciting and interesting the school could be too. And uh, Leah has come back uh, several times since then, and she's co-organized a number of uh, theme uh, talks around evolution and development. And uh, so for our 10th anniversary school, it was really appropriate that Leah could come here again. and. Uh, update us on the work that she's been doing on comparative cognition and uh, particularly to tell us about how our cortex has evolved uh, from and, and relates to the cortex of other animals. So there. Thanks, Tony. Um, um, so I, I am going to talk to you about the, the brains of a lot of different, other, uh, different species. Um, and I am going to come to conclusions about the human brain and, and very grand, big, sweeping statements about the human brain, but I don't work on human brains. In fact, I don't really care about humans. Um, <laughs> I realize that. <laughs> I, I, I really don't care about humans. Um, I'm interested in how complexity, is, uh, how complexity and brain organization evolved. And at the time, I, I really got interested in that question. I was working on non-human primates, and I realized that that was the, the stupidest way to address that question was to look at the, the most complex animal model that we have, which is were, were macaque monkeys. So what I did is I, I, I decided to look at a lot of different species. And I went to Australia, as Tony mentioned, to work on duck-billed platypus, which are monotremes. They have a number of features of organization that therap our therapsid reptile um, ancestors had, including egg laying. Um, so, but one thing that happened when I went to Australia was I learned that I was not working on brains, because I had to catch every single animal that I worked on. And it, it's harder than you think. And it made me realize that you, if you really want to understand about brains, not the brain, because there isn't a brain. There are brains. Um, and there are variations of, of, of a common plan. Um, you, can't, you can't just look at the brain. You absolutely positively have to understand the brain-body relationships. And so for my first slide, I, I used to have brains on my slide. Um, and now I have animal bodies as well, because I think it's really, really important. These happen to be um, rodents, and I do this on pur purpose, but because people have, always have rodent models. And um, there are over 2,000 species of rodents, and they fear, fill a variety of niches. And of course, they have brain specializations associated um, um, with those niches. OK, so the portion of the brain I want to um, talk about or concentrate on is the neocortex. This is the back view of a brain of a, a bottlenose dolphin, and this is a brain of a a, a small marsupial, these aren't even taken to scale, in Australia, which is called a native cat. And the first thing you can see is this animal has a little teeny tiny portion of the neocortex, a little cap of neocortex. And this animal has a huge expanded neocortex. Um, and the reason I want to study the neocortex is because it, it's the portion of the brain, um, at, as our, our first speaker pointed out, that is involved in uh, many important things, including perception, cognition, language reading, volitional motor control. 
Um, it's also the portion of the, of the mammalian brain that has changed most dramatically over the course of evolution compared to our spinal cord and our brain stem and our midbrain and I would even argue our thalamus. Um, so we know that the, cortex, the neocortex has changed in size. We've known that for a very long time. Um, we've also known that this increase in size is generally associated with an increase in um, complex capabilities. And I, I won't say intelligence because I think it's a little bit too anthropocentric. Um, this is a classic slide from Brodmann's work in um, 1909. The neocortex is, we, so we've known for some time that the neocortex hasn't just gotten bigger in some species. Um, he did an architectonic analysis where he actually looked at the structure of the brain and said, well, this part looks a little different than this green part, which looks a little different than this, this stippled part, and so on. And, and he did a beautiful comparative analysis. I think he did nine different species. And what he, sh what he showed is that something like a human brain has many, many, many parts, which he hypothesized, even in the absence of functional data, that they were, they were involved in very distinct functions. Um, he also looked at small brains like the European hedgehog, and he, he noted that there were some areas of the neocortex that were similar in all species, and, and, and these are called homologous. So we know, we know from the fossil, the fossil record can tell us a lot. It can tell us uh, the overall size of the brain, it can tell us whether brains are fissured or not fissured, but it doesn't, soft, soft tissue doesn't fossilize, so we're stuck with skulls. We know that the common ancestor of all mammals some 200 million years ago, maybe a little more, had a really teeny tiny neocortex. Comparative studies, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, have, have indicate that not only did the first mammal have a little teeny tiny neocortex, it had probably about 15 or, or, or 17 cortical fields. Compared to something like a human, which of course I don't know about humans, <laughs> but I think they have now hundreds of cortical fields, right? So the question is how do you go from a little teeny cap of neocortex with perhaps 10 to 15 fields to something that's really enormous, this expanded cortical sheet that has multiple, multiple cortical fields. So the prob there, this is a problem, though. It's a really interesting question. So how do you get more complex? How do you get more complex brain? How do you get more complex behavior? Um, we can't answer this question directly, because these kinds of changes occur over hundreds of millions of years. Um, and even small changes can take tens of thousands to millions of years to occur. So we can't study, the, we can't study evolution, evolution directly. What we can do is we can, we can study the products of the evolutionary process. So what does evolution produce? Evolution has produced bodies and evolution has produced brains. So I can look, but you know, in order to understand brains, I don't want to just look at one brain. If I knew nothing about the human brain, and now we have non-invasive um, imaging techniques, but before that, most of what we knew about human brains came from work on other animals. We made inferences. The more animals you look at, the better your inference. So this is a really good example. Let's say I knew nothing about humans or human brains, and I said, okay, I'm gonna study macaque monkey because they are a, a relatively closely related ancestor. They're about 60 to 70 million years divergence between our lineages. And I said, okay, um, humans have frontally pl placed eyes because I'm seeing this in macaque monkeys. The answer is correct, yes. Humans have um, a, an, expand, an expanded temporal lobe. Yes, they do. Humans have cheek pouches, no. Humans have a tail, no. So I need to look at a lot of different primates in order to make accurate inferences about an unknown form. Um, and so evolution can do that. Evolution can tell us what sorts of changes, um, I mean, a comparative analysis can tell us what, so, what sorts of changes evolution has produced. However, we know that species are different. Some species have large neocortex with many parts, and some species have this very small neocortex with a few parts. Bodies change. So. While evolution tell, well, comparative studies tell us what evolution has produced, if we study development, um, we, can, we can understand how those phenotypic transformations occur. The evolution of the neocortex is really the evolution of developmental mechanisms that give rise to some aspect of the phenotype. So um, this is the part of my talk, this is what I'm gonna focus on right now. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna do, I'll show you a few comparative uh, studies. Um, and of course, there are going to be pictures of mammals and stuff because it kind of keeps everybody interested. And, uh, <laughs> and, but I'm going to focus on development and, and how phenotypic trans transitions occur throughout the course of evolution and within the life of an individual. OK, so what am I comparing? Um, I'm going to compare functional organization, neural response properties, um, cortical connections, cortical architecture, gene expression, um, epigenetic marks, lifestyle and behavior. Most often when we're doing a comparative analysis, we, we try to use, I'm not gonna do this in every single animal I'd show you, but we try to use some combination of techniques in order to, in order to make uh, valid uh, subdivisions of the neocortex and, and more accurate inferences 
um, about unknown forms like the human form. Okay, so comparative studies. This is. Yeah, I, am I making noise? Well, yes, you are. The, I thought I was giving a talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, how's this? Is it good? Okay, because I thought I was doing the feedback thing. All right. So, um, so this is work. Uh, these are a variety of different brains taken from my laboratory or from work in our laboratory. And you don't have to, you don't have to worry about what the co those colors are. They're meant to indicate different cortical fields. For instance, blue is visual cortex. Um, red is somatosensory cortex. Yellow is auditory cortex. And again, this is an unknown form. And for a really long time, this was an un unknown form. So comparative studies um, indicate that there is a common plan or constellation of cortical fields that all species have, presumably inherited from the common ancestor. That would be the inference, is that it's inherited from the common ancestor. But there are also some changes. What's really interesting about this comparative analysis is that we can, we can see some, some large differences um, in, in terms of brain size. But, but we still see this constellation of cortical fields. And what's really important, and this is one of my favorite examples, this is a blind mole rat. This is where its eyes should be. So this animal has microphthalmic eyes, and the skin has grown over its eyes. And this is work by Sadaka and Wolberg. Um, and it's, I, I should have redrawn this, this photo of the brain. But what's important here is that these animals don't use their eyes for visual processing. They use them for circadian, for only the circadian aspect of vision. Um, but they still have that constellation of cortical fields. You can't get rid of it. it it's, it's a serious constraint. They still have a visual cortex. They still have a geniculocortical cortical pathway. Um, it's gotten smaller, and it's been co-opted by the auditory system. But they can't get rid of components of that plan. But as I said, um, there are radical changes in that plan of organization. So this is a flattened macaque monkey brain. Um, rostral, or the front of the brain, is here. Um, this is the uh, medial is to the top. And this is a mouse brain. Um, Notice the scales are quite different. We can still see the aspects of common organization, red field, blue field, green, uh, green uh, posterior parietal cortex, small auditory cortex. But there are clearly some radical changes. Uh, as I mentioned, changes in the size of the cortical sheet. We can see ch um, uh, changes in the relative location, obviously addition of cortical fields. So what I've done here is I've done a little um, illustration that outlines just um, the systems level changes that Comparative studies have, uh, have um, pointed out, um, OK. So this is, the, this is meant to uh, be the cortical sheet. And some of the changes, can I step away? I feel really constrained. Uh, uh, I already talked about there's a uh, change in the absolute and relative size of the cortical sheet. There's also a change in sensory domain allocation. So what I mean by sensory domain allocation is portions of the cortical sheet are devoted to visual processing versus auditory processing versus somatosensory processing versus motor cortex, if you're a eutherian animal. Um, and how that cortex is divvied up is different in different species. Um, there are changes in the relative size of cortical fields. So even though I can identify primary visual cortex in all of the species. The percentage of cortex that primary visual cortex occupies is different in the different species. There are changes in the magnification and of behaviorally relevant body parts. And this is for the somatosensory system. So if I have an effector um, that's important, like a hand, or in humans, the, our oral structures, I have a large representation of, of that portion of my body in my cortex within the somatosensory system. We also have a large representation of central vision. Um, echolocating bats have a large representation of ultrasonic frequencies with which they um, use to capture prey and navigate in the environment. Addition of modules, which I'm not going to talk about. I already uh, mentioned we have an increase in the number of cortical fields um, and an increase in the connections of cortical fields. So, so what I want to talk about today um, predominantly are how, how, increases in, how changes in sensory domain allocation occur. Um, magnification of behaviorally relevant body parts and alterations in connections occur in species over time and within the life of an individual. Okay, so an important question is what factors contribute to these systems level changes? Genetic inheritance, changes in DNA sequence are going to lead to changes in brains and changes in bodies. Many people when they're thinking about brains focus on genes intrinsic to the de developing neocortex. And, and 
people have worked out genes that are involved in aerialization or the generation of cortical fields, the generation of connections, and the genetic cascades that are involved in, in unraveling a neocortex. Also to keep in mind is genes that are extrinsic to the cortex but intrinsic to the animal, genes that are involved in body plan development. How have they changed? How, can, we, can we compare those? Then we're, we have what I'm going to call epigenetic um, changes or alterations that are due to context where the sensory environment can alter um, gene transcription and expression, which in turn will, will alter aspects of the cortical phenotype. So the studies that I want to talk about, and this is the big question in my lab, can we induce the modifications that evolution has have made in a developing brain by tweaking something in that developing brain that we, th we think is being naturally tweaked um, throughout the course of evolution and generate not just um, a, a, a viable animal and a viable neocortex, but a neocortex that's consistent with what evolution would produce. So can I make those tweaks that are naturally occurring in species over time? Okay, so this is the, um, this is the overview of my talk. I'm gonna talk about examples from the natural world, um, experimental manipulations in peripheral morphology, um, comparisons of wild and laboratory rats, a newer, I might have talked a little bit about this last time I was here, comparisons of a new project we, we call that's we have, it's called Laboratory Rats Gone Wild, and then natural variation in early sensory experience within a population. Okay, so changes in peripheral morphology, this is one of my all-time favorites. This is a duck-billed platypus. So this is why I went to Australia to work on duck-billed platypus, and most people don't even know what a platypus is, um, but I was pretty excited, and I had to catch these guys. And um, I don't know if you know this about platypus. Um, they have mechanosensory receptors that run in stripes along their bill, and these are interdigitated with electrosensory receptors. When they're doing anything important in the environment, like navigating, um, capturing prey, having sex, they close their eyes, their ears, and their nose. So they're one big, huge, enormous bill. That's it, right? So, so we went, we, we did an experiment, and we exposed the entire cortical sheet, and we went in with hundreds of electrode penetrations, and we recorded um, what the neurons were interested in listening to, whether they were interested in vision, audition, somatic sensation, and if they're interested in somatic sensation, um, what parts or representations, what, what did their body representation look like? And this is what it looked like. This is the rostral and this is medial. This is primary somatosensory cortex right here. And this blue and red structure is the representation of the bill. So 90% of the primary somatosensory area is devoted to processing inputs from the bill. This is the, the body, here's the forepaw. So this is like a platypunculus, right? Um, we found another representation that was rostral. This is probably something like S2PV. And, but again, look at the bill representation here, little teeny body representation. Auditory cortex is completely embedded in somatosensory cortex. And you have this crappy little visual cortex on top. I mean, it's you know, pretty, pretty pathetic. They have really small eyes. So about 75% um, so about of the entire cortical sheet is devoted to processing inputs from the bill. Right? That's, so that's a huge, huge cortical magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part. Um, and also, there's differences in sensory domain allocation with somatosensory assuming most of the, new, uh, most of the cortical sheet. So the question is, um, to what extent are these differences due to genes intrinsic to the developing neocortex? So if somehow I can develop that brain without inputs from the bill, would I still get an architectonic structure that looked like the bill in the cortex? Um, to what extent are these changes due to genes associated with, um, or, um, these differences in the cortex due to genes associated with the development of the body, right? Because, you know, that's a really um, derived morphology. Um, to what extent are they due to epigenetic influences on the body, um, like gravitational stress in water um, and, and alterations in bone density, sensory stimuli present throughout development, and clearly use of the morphology. I mean, you never have a specialized morphological receptor that you don't use in a specialized way, right? You're, you're interfacing um, that effector array most effectively with what you want to explore or where you want to navigate. Okay, so this is work from um, Dennis O'Leary's laboratory. So I want to talk first about genes intrinsic to the neocortex um, and how they alter cortical field size. Um, this is a mouse. This is rostral. This is medial. Here's V1. This is S1. Here's A1. And what he did is he, he looked at some of those genes intrinsic to the neocortex. This is a transcription factor called EMX2. And he overexpressed it. And he said, OK, what's going to happen to cortical fields if I overexpress this transcription factor that's, that, that is expressed as a gradient on the cortical sheet? And, what he, and I drew it here as a little cartoon form. And what he sees compared to the normal mouse is you have an increase in the size of, relative size of V1. Um, you have a 
decrease in the size of S1, and the cortical fields are shifted rostrally. So some of those systems level changes, like rel the relative size of a cortical field, for example, um, I can change that by changing genes intrinsic to the neocortex. I, you can change co um, connections um, by, by altering the expression patterns of genes intrinsic to the neocortex. And, and there are... Um, any changes in behavior? See, the thing is, they do the, the I, mouse behavior, right? So yes. So there are people who have done sort of changes in pushing motor cortex back, and you know, so visual cortex and somatosensory cortex is all squished to the back. And they'll do things like, how does the animal perform on a roto rod? Do you know what that is? I mean, it's really sh crappy behavior. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, and people use the same thing to, in to interpret all kinds of different changes in the RAP brain. So that, I don't think the behavior is as good. But the, this is a really good question because behavior is the target of selection. Genes are not the target of selection. There was, there, there was propagated across generations. Peripheral morphology is the target of selection. Our extended phenotype, or what we build, can be the target of selection. But brains are not the target of selection. Behavior is the target of selection. Anyway, so this is a, one of my favorite comparisons. This is from Criticos' lab. And what he's done is, so look, you've got, you've got the, the forelimb of a, of a mouse and the wing of a bat. And you're like, wow, that's really radical changes in peripheral morphology. It turns out that there are only a few, few players in terms of development of the body, few, a few genes that are involved in, in transforming this into something like this. And I'm just give, showing you an example of one, which is PRX1. Um, and, and this is the part of the gene that's, uh, this is the part that's involved in lengthening the forearm, right? So here's the lengthened forearm. This is d digit five, digit four, digit three, digit two, and digit one is, is free. Um, and if he compares the expression of PRX1 in bat versus mouse, what he sees is that the spatial extent is much greater. He, they've done really cool studies where they've put the um, promoter, the bat promoter of PRX1 in a mouse and they get an extended forearm. There are, I think there's, it's called gremlin normally is involved in apoptosis of interdigit membranes. There's a gene that inhibits that. So there's just like a, a couple of things that are going on that can change, that can radically alter the phenotype. Um, but in total, how many genes are involved if you really, because now you show us one example of PRX1, but it will not be PRX1 acting on its own. No, no. Right? Right, so right. How big is that collection, roughly? I, I would say, I mean, this isn't my area of expertise, but I, I've, writ, wrote, writ, I've written about it, maybe about five or six okay. that, are, that are different, right? That there are five or six different things that are occurring within the forelimb of a bat versus a, versus a mouse. Um, and there's really, really nice work um, by Sterbling D'Angelo, um, others, where they, they've sort of mapped out, look, this is a electron microscope. These wings have specialized hairs, um, and they have specialized uh, Merkel, cell, um, Merkel cells, and they're distributed differentially on the wing. And if you stick an electrode in S1, in the wing representation, those neurons are exquisitely sensitive to little teeny tiny changes in air pressure. This makes complete sense if you have self-propelled flight and there are diff you know, differences in, in cur uh, air current and so on. <clears throat> what I want to point out, though, um, this is an echolocating bat, and normally they have a very large auditory cortex. But if you do this comparison of an echolocating bat and a mouse, they have about the same size cortical sheet. But if you look at the, the forelimb representation of a bat versus a mouse, it's really, really large. Maybe not to the same extent as the platypus bill, but it's really, really large. And so you ask yourself, is this due to something intrinsic, genes intrinsic to, in S1 that are generating this enlarged bill? Or is it simply due to alterations in body, peripheral morphology, sensor receptor arrays, which then manifests as a change in, in, in the neocortex? So this, uh, the, this first little part uh, is meant to show you that the brain is enslaved by the body. The brain is not embodied itself, except if you're an octopus, right, where most of your brain are, is in your forelimbs. But there's a middleman, and it's called the body. The, you know, I think, you know, when I first started, I said I worked on brains. And I think I watched too many Star Trek movies with the brain bubbling in the, the, the oxygenated water with all these wires going out, and it's like taking over the world. Um, that can't ever happen. <laughs> um, we need our bodies. Um, and, and so I think we need to, you know, focus more on body and behavior when we're, when we're thinking about brains. And this is just, um, I showed you an example of the bill of the platypus um, and this is work from Ken Catania's lab where he shows similar things in a star-nosed mole. The um, incisors of a naked mole rat can move independently and they're used in object um, discrimination. You have 
huge representations. And so I, I kind of take this to the human saying, you know, there's this, people are doing com comparative genomics and looking for what is the gene or set of genes that make humans different from other species, um, and, and, and or what cortical fields are distinct in humans. And this is to show that if we, re if we want to like sort of reinterpret Broca's area, we can say this is simply an expansion of premotor, motor cortex, somatosensory cortex that are involved in, um, in, in vocal production. Not, I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying it's not a, a human specialization, but it takes the same form. We haven't stepped outside the rules of, of how brains change. Um, and of course, there, there are alterations in connectivity. Okay, so now I want to uh, talk a little bit about our developmental experiments. And in fact, the rest of our, um, my presentation is gonna be on our developmental experiments. And, and what, what we're doing is we're manipulating peripheral morphology. And the, the animal that we use is the short-tailed opossum, and we do this for a couple of reasons. One is that it has a really beautiful neocortex, and the, the, visual, the system that we're gonna manipulate is the visual system. And compared to mice, they have a really big, beautiful V1. But most, more important is, um, this is retinal ganglion cell axons reach their vis visual centers of the diencephalon before, I think, well, around postnatal day five to seven. Um, and thalamocortical afferents reach the cortex about postnatal day five to seven. So all of these events occur um, in utero in, in many of our animal models, but in Monodelphus domestica, they, they, um, they occur um, ex utero. And they, these guys look like this. This is, I think, a P4 animal, which is when we make our manipulations. And you can see a little teeny eye here, little limb. They don't even have any hind limbs yet. And this is a centimeter scale. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a sledgehammer to the system. So I wanna say, okay, those systems level changes that I mentioned in the beginning, to what extent are they due to um, just differential ratio of incoming sensory inputs into the developing brain? So one way to radically change the ratio of incoming sensory inputs to the developing brain is to remove a sensory system. And an easy sensory system to remove is the eye. So we bilaterally enucleate these guys at P4 before the brain has formed any connections. We let them grow up. Then we do a lot of different tests. The, the, what am I comparing? We do electrophysiological recordings. We do architectonic analysis. We do studies of connections. Um, we do single unit recordings and, and also looking at behavior. So that's what I want to present right now. So this is just a normal opossum. This is front. This is the top of the brain. Here's V1. Here's S1. This is a bilateral nucleate. I'm gonna put them into cartoon form for you. There's no change in the overall size of the cortical sheet, but you can see we've radically altered the size of V1. Um, S1 has gotten larger. We actually made some measurements. Um, we, we, two important things. <clears throat> we did nothing to the neocortex itself. We simply changed the ratio of incoming sensory input. But what's really cool is this looks like an animal, the, the brain of an animal that has no visual system, like a blind mole rat. We couldn't get rid of V1 as architectonically uh, identified. Um, we still had a geniculocortical pathway. We couldn't get rid of that. Everything just got smaller. And as you'll see, the system's been co-opted. So when each one of these little dots is in electrode penetration, and the blue dots represent um, a, a, penetrations where neurons were responsive to visual stimulation, the green dots where neurons were responsive to auditory stimulation, and the red dots where neurons were responsive to somatosensory stimulation. And this is a normal animal, and this is a bilateral nucleate. So all of this cortex that would, <clears throat> would normally be visual has been taken over by the auditory, excuse me, <clears throat> the auditory and the somatosensory system. Should I take care of it? Right, so, so this has all been taken over by the somatosensory and auditory system. After how many days? This is an, this is an animal that's an adult. Okay. So we let these guys grow up to be adults. So this is really cool. So when we looked at the receptive fields or what part of the body were those neurons interested in, right? So we're, we're, we're making our body maps. Um, almost all of those neurons in that reorganized visual cortex um, had receptive fields on the snout, the face, the vibrissi, and the head. So in essence, this animal became like a big duck-billed platypus, right? I mean, so it's one big, huge head. Normally, this, this would be visual. And so we put anatomical tracers into V1. And this, obviously, in this guy, we couldn't go in and do electrophysiological recordings first. So we, we did this post hoc. We had to identify whether or not it was in architectonically defined V1. Um, and what we found is that it had normal connectivity with CT 
with entorhinal cortex, so we didn't get rid of that. Um, but it also had projections from the somatosensory system, the auditory system, and even frontal cortex compared to normal animals. And if you looked at the uh, thalamocortical pathways, it was getting input from the ventroposterior nucleus, which is normally associated with somatosensory processing, and with the medial geniculate nucleus, which was associated with auditory processing. But it still had input from the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so if we look at just a, a connectome of, of what the differences are, this is a cortical projections. Um, this is a P4 nucleate, and this is a cytic control, thalamocortical projections. We can see that major pathways are preserved but then there are additional connections that you just don't see in, in um, normal animals. So this is work that was done by a graduate student in my lab, Jimmy Dooley. Um, if you remember, let me go back here. What we found in a number of our bilateral nucleates was that somatosensory cortex and auditory cortex were also reorganized. So it wasn't just that we, um, the targeted system was, was reorganized, but in a number, not all, there was variability. Um, in a number of our animals, we had variability in the in functional organization of somatosensory cortex. So Jimmy looked at connections of somatosensory cortex. <clears throat> this is an injection of an anatomical tracer. Here's, this is a site of control. This is a, a bilateral nucleate. All these little dots are lab back labeled neurons, retrogradely labeled neurons. And you can see that there's a basic pattern that's preserved, but there are a lot of extra connections. So. So they, they're not as massive of, as what we see for the visual system, but it's sort of like throwing a rock in a pond where the biggest perturbation is where the rock went in, but you still have this ripple effect. So, so not only is the visual cortex radically reorganized, but somatosensory cortex is reorganized as well. And this is just quantification, looking at percentages. So there's a way you can quantify the number of connections. This means... Um, <clears throat> Projections are stronger in a nucleus if, if the bars are pointed upward, and projections are stronger in sighted animals if the bars are facing downward. If they were the same, there'd be very little variability. They would all hover around this line right here. And this is the differences in thalamocortical connectivity. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And this is, these are just connectomes of what this, this brain is looking like right now. Um, a nucleus to the left, and this is uh, for visual cortex, um, cortex and thalamus, um, and then sighted controls. And you can see that the wiring's quite different. OK, so a um, graduate student in my lab, I was going to say newer, but Deepa's, Deepa was here two years ago. Which I think she was here two years ago or three years ago. Um, she's graduating, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, so she went into somatosensory cortex and said, OK, well, we know that the overall functional organization is different in somatosensory cortex, but what about neural response properties? And what she found is, yes, the neural response properties are different, that these um, animals have smaller receptive fields, um, in addition, this is a little complicated, but what this means is that although these animals, <clears throat> their detection is not as good as sighted controls, but their, discrimina their discrimina this discriminability of, of, of a given neuron for a whisker is much better. So that they can, a neuron in cortex can discriminate between one and two whiskers, whereas in a normal animal, the, those receptive fields are bigger and their discriminability is not as good as sighted uh, uh, controls is not as good as as the um, bilateral nucleates. So what I want to show you, because I'm going to show you a bunch of behavior now. I know, I'm just like a, a, a pain in the ass speaker. I have all these, I get hot, I get cold. I have to have my, have to have my microphone. <laughs> I have to have my chapstick, my water. Um, I got my husband. <laughs> I brought everybody. OK, so what I want to show you is, is now I want to talk about the behavior of these bilateral nucleates. Um, let me see if I can do this. I think I have to touch the screen. First of all, this is a rat. This is from Tony, showing rat whisking. He's the one who gave us the idea to start looking at um, whisking more carefully in Monodelphus domestica. This is, and this is just to show you that these animals, they do use their whiskers. They whisk and they use them for discrimination. This is a normal opossum. And this is a bilateral nucleate. And you can see them whisking, which is one of the reasons we also focused on the whiskers. And so <clears throat> this is to show, first of all, that these are, uh, I can't remember what age they are, but they're, they're relatively small. They're, they're juveniles. So maybe they're a couple months, maybe a month. And it's to show that normal activity patterns in bilateral nucleates, so there are sighted animals in here, and there are bilateral nucleates. And this is sped up eight times. This guy right here is a bilateral nucleate. You can see, see some, that's a bilateral nucleate. There's some sighted controls in there. You can see them racing all over the place. The point is, in fact, bilateral nucleates 
um, have this, about the same amount of activity, but there is a trend for the duration of activity bouts to be longer in bilateral nucleates than cytocontrols. So this is probably the slide that I am the most proud of. Um, darn it. No, that's not the slide I'm most proud of. That, this is the slide I'm the most proud of. Are you sure? <laughs> it's the same thing. So, 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 so this is the story I tell of my most brilliant idea of the year. This was last year I had this most brilliant idea. Here it is. Well, it was, maybe it was 2015. My dog died, our dog died, Luna died. That sounds very sad and, and I'm, o I'm over it now. But we got another dog, we got another dog, Jack. And Jack was a German Shepherd. And like we knew he was gonna grow. He is now like over 100 pounds and he's about two and a half years old. And so, you know, Scott and I are like, we gotta go to, we gotta go to dog school. We gotta go to the dog school so we can learn how to train our dog. And when I was at the dog school, you know, like this woman, she was like the dog whisperer. She can make even like the stupid dogs do anything. Or, or do I mean stupid owners, but she can make the stupid dogs do anything. And so I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we've been working on monodelphous behavior for years, getting nowhere. I mean, like, we would be all trained up and the monod monodelphous just would not behave. And so I thought to myself, you know, why don't I get Petco Girl to train our monodelphous domestica? And so I asked her if she wanted a job. And so this is what I have to show for it now. So that was my most brilliant idea. Why do I have graduate students training animals when they have no idea what they're doing? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> uh, so, so I just want to simplify this for you. So what, what the animals had to do is that it was a team maze. They had to make texture discriminations, right? So they make these te texture discrimination. They had to discriminate between rough and smooth. And we used sandpaper. And it was pretty straightforward. This is smooth as no sandpaper. Um, the, um, the, the higher the sandpaper number, the, sm the smoother it is. No, wait. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. The higher the sandpaper, the smooth, smoother it is. We had a base panel grid of 120. So if you say, okay, I am going to have something that's completely smooth and, and, and versus, um, <laughs> versus 120, which is super, super rough, animals can make these discriminations really easily. But then if you, I'm showing you the P4 nucleates inside of controls, as we get closer and closer um, to the grit, um, the side of controls fall off. And what this asterisk is me meant to represent is that all of these are significantly different. Of course, when you're comparing 120 to 120, they do really poorly. Um, but at these finer grits, or with these, these differences, when the, as the grits become closer and closer together, the bilateral nucleates do, do better, significantly better. But this is even cooler so what we did, we said, okay, is this mediated by their whiskers? So we had them do this test, and then we cut their whiskers. And look what happens. Their performance falls close to chance, right? So although in our normal animals, we didn't have that issue. So what, so what we, we went on to ask ourselves is, so we have this natural plasticity, and this, it's doing something, right? It's making these animals better able to discriminate, and they're making tactile discriminations better, not just with their neurons, but with their, with their whole bodies. So our idea is, can we, can we direct and amplify this naturally occurring plasticity by rearing the before, animals? Before we go there, there's something confusing about the, 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 your, the result you just showed, this one, the whisker trimming. Uh, why would the side of control still perform here? Um, it could be they're using, it could be they're using a forepaws or a different strategy. I mean, we, I mean. But is it sight, you think? They can use sight? No, we do these experiments in the dark. Okay, so that's gotta be it then. No. So it's really the neural processing. Right, it, these are, these, this is, these experiments, okay. I'm sorry, these experiments are done in the dark. And so when we first saw this, we're like, hmm. I mean, but the data's the data. Mm -hmm. And my guess is they're probably, now what we did is, we only cut off the mustachial vibrissae, we're gonna cut off the genial, and then we're gonna cut off the chin hairs. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, that may fall out. Um, or it could be they're using their, their forepaws more. So I, I just think it's a strategy difference. All right. So yeah, so we wanted to see if we reared them in an environment that had more textures um, and that was larger, if that would sort of force that or push that plasticity. Uh, and we'll make them super tactile animals. And I should say what we do is every two days, the cage gets changed out so it's, it doesn't become a spatial memory task. So they have to navigate and find their food and their water using this, in, in this larger cage. And I should say, hey, look at this guy. This is a little bilateral nucleate. They do really quite well. And we're still doing the electrophysiology on that, but we, we have been looking at a different sort of task and how they perform some of these enriched versus standard animals and just also um, 
um, in, in light and dark. And let me just explain this task. This is a new graduate student in my lab, Mackenzie Eglund, and he's been doing these. So this is a really clever task. And what I like about it is it, it not only, um, not only, well, I'll show you that what happens, not, not only are they using their, their whiskers to, to navigate this task, but this task allows us to also test how animals do in a novel situation. So what you do is it's called a ladder rung task. You see these, it's got plexiglass walls and it's got these little rungs. And when we're training the animals, they get trained when the rungs are evenly spaced. So we let them off at one end, um, they go to the other end and they can navigate across it pretty well. We, we're testing this, we, can we test it in the light and the dark and enriched and versus standard. This is a normal animal, this is a bilateral nucleate, right? So what you can do, so they, they learn how to do this really rapidly. Then what you do is you take out these sticks and you can put them in some sort of random order so that there's, the rungs are no longer evenly spaced, but they're randomly spaced. Some, some distances are larger, some are small, right? And so, well, you can see that the enriched do, um, the enriched nucleates do really well on this task compared to, to normals. Um, and um, this is a different task we're not gonna show you that. But let me just, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna show you the film about uh, uh, of what this sort of looks like. So this is a normal animal navigating this task in the dark. And you can see him, there he is. And how you count in errors when their foot falls through. Right, they make a slip, they make a slip. Okay. Now this is a bilateral nucleate in the dark. Yeah, they're pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah. I know, isn't that awesome? Okay, and this is, I mean, this is the sort of thing that excites me. Yeah, yeah like my mother is like, she's, she's given up hope. <laughs> okay, so, so now this is really cool. You guys saw that bilateral nucleate, how well they did. This is the one that had his whiskers trimmed. Check this out. Oops, sorry. Okay, check this out. I didn't cut this film. Okay, here he goes. Aww. Right, so he's using the whiskers. I mean, this isn't just I'm showing you changes in the brain. That's him with his whiskers trimmed. They'll, don't worry, they're gonna grow back. <laughs> or he's gonna be used in an anatomical experiment. <laughs> <laughs> the happy end after all. <laughs> He'll, he'll be on a slide, don't worry. He's, he's, he's got a future on a slide somewhere, someday. Um, so th this, is, this is another sort of task that we're doing, and I just want to show you this because I, they're pretty powerful. The top is, this is a normal animal. This is a reach task. I don't know if you can see this. This is a plexiglass box, and there's a little slit through here. And we put a little cricket on there, and the animal reaches for it. And this, this, these are both slowed down. So we're currently collecting data on this. And you can see he's... This is in the light, he's looking at it, he goes in. They're pretty good, right? Yeah. Now, so, so obviously I think part of this task is controlled by, by olfaction as well. You're gonna see the bilateral, bilateral nucleate performs a little bit differently, but he does finally get it. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. So he's kind of, interfacing his whiskers around this whole thing. It does pretty well. Oh, it takes a little longer. Okay, <clears throat> so, so I've shown you functional organization, connectivity, single neuro, res neuro response, behavior, and this is a colleague of mine, Danielle Stolzenberg. <clears throat> she was here a couple years ago too, right? Yeah. That was fun, that was a fun year what I remember of it. We went out a lot, <laughs> that's what I remember. Anyway, <laughs> what she wants to do now is look at genetic mechanisms that may be involved in these alterations in cortical organization. Um, not just genes associated with the development of, of neocortex normally, but are you changing um, um, modification through histone proteins or epigenetic marks, things that ch can change transcription um, that are not actually inducing changes in DNA sequence. And this is just a, I'm just gonna show you this one slide. Um, and what we've done is we've developed this little micropunch technique where we can take out portion of V1 and we can look at genes that, like EMX2, PAC6 that are involved um, in aspects like uh, of cortical aerialization, like ID2, for example. Um, it's involved in a number of important developmental events, in, including the formation of cortical cortical connections. SCN1B um, is involved in um, 
regulating voltage-gated sodium channels and so on. So, so that's the kind of other direction that, that we're going. Okay, this is this interim summary. Blindness is not simply a, a, an absence of light. So a lot of times you say, okay, I wonder what it's like to be blind. I'm going to close my eyes. That's not what it's like to be blind because you've completely rewired not just your visual system, but your somatosensory system, which impacts your behavior. It is a different, it's a different brain. Okay. So, um, so, okay, like I said, that was taking a sledgehammer to the system, right? Like completely removing the eyes, and that that's, d doesn't normally happen. Um, so now what I want to do is show you a series of more subtle experiments. Um, this is uh, Katie Campy. She was a graduate student in my laboratory. I'm just going to show you, I want to show you this because it, 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 it got us doing another set of experiments. And, and natural drift differences in sensory dri driven activity. The idea of these studies was we said, okay, let's look at the, let's look at the visual cortex in diurnal versus nocturnal rodents. So what, what we did was say, okay, our, our nocturnal rodent can be a rat. Then we had a diurnal rat, which was a, um, which was a Nile grass rat. And then we were comparing, we were comparing these rats with um, wild caught squirrels, tree squirrels and ground squirrels. And you know, I'm thinking about it, I'm like, you know, Katie, it doesn't seem fair to compare a laboratory rat with a wild caught squirrel. I mean, you have an animal that's, right, growing in something like this. So I said, I've got a really good idea. This wasn't my most brilliant idea, but it was a good idea. <laughs> I said, you should go out and catch wild rats. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know about wild rats in California, but they, they, have, they carry the plague. Like the bubonic, they have the fleas that carry the bubonic plague. And she's like, this is going to be a great idea. You know, I, I love graduate students that are like that. You could say, go, go jump off a cliff. Oh, that would be such a good idea. Is there a paper I could read about that? <laughs> anyway, so, so she caught Radis norvegus, and, and she compared it with the, the squirrels. And she also compared it, why not, compare it with laboratory Radis norvegus, right? So wild, wild caught and, and laboratory. And we only... We, we just started doing some of this. She published a couple papers on it, and then she left the laboratory. But I'm just going to give you a feeling for all this. This is kind of complicated. Um, we're just showing differences, sort of like what you would see. Both rats have a larger S1 compared to um, the squirrels. Squirrels have a larger visual cortex. You know, a number of these things were, um, were not too different. But what I want to focus you on are the laboratory rats versus the wild rats. And what we see is if you're just measuring the relative size of cortical fields, Laboratory rats have a bigger S1 and a bigger A1. Um, and we kind of concentrated on visual cortex. And when we looked at cellular comp composition of visual cortex using isotropic fractionation, we found that there were a larger percentage of neurons in V1 in wild rats, and, there was a lar and, and neurons were also more densely packed in, in these wild animals compared to novel animals. So she left the laboratory, and that, kind of, that study kind of fell off to the wayside, because it would be really cool to you know, do electrophysiologic recordings and a number of other things. So, um, so what we did instead was we did this, we started this experiment called Laboratory Rats Gone Wild. I know. Is that Tony right there? <laughs> that, that's, that's me and that's Scott. Scott's always the responsible drinker. Okay. <laughs> he's, just, he's just uncorking the wine. Anyway, so, so this is done in conjunction with Dylan Cook and Danielle Stolzenberg. So we have something really cool in Davis. Um, and, and again, the, the big question is, you know, is this, can we, can, can we really understand species typical behavior when we're rearing an animal in a cage like this? So we have these field pens in Puda Creek, Puda Creek Repair and Reserve. This is an aerial view of it. Here's a bigger view of it. And they're like 3,000 times the size of a regular rat cage. So it's not quite laboratory rats gone wild. We call them semi-naturally re semi naturally reared. Um, this is, here's Dylan. We have to go clean them out. They have, we feed them and water them, but they have access to they can hear uh, predator calls. They have little critters get in there, and they can eat them if they want, including, including bugs and so on. Um, and we, we have the whole field pen is video surveillance over the nest box and everywhere, so we can also look at behavior. These are the range of environmental conditions, 43 to 12 degrees Celsius. So we have them there in the summer. We have them there in the winter. Humidity differences, earthquakes. We even had an earthquake. Yeah, predator cues. And I should say, so what we do is we get pregnant rat mothers and we put the pregnant mothers in the cage, and she gives birth out in those field pens. And we directly then compare them with laboratory animals. And this is a, just a view of what they look, a video surveillance over their, over their cages at different postnatal ages. And we look at a lot of different things. So we're, we're, we're going out there looking at body weight, temperature, behavioral tests, motor maps, um, connections, epigenetic markers. I'm, just, I'm gonna focus on these 
motor maps, but I want to show you that something that's really cool. Every single thing that we looked at is different. So for instance, eye opening is different. Um, uh, um, when they start walking, our gait is different. Um, surface riding is different. We're doing a number of other tests, and I'm going to talk about this maybe a little bit. Um, but what Dylan and I were interested in was looking at the motor maps, because we thought one of the things that are, that are really going to be impacted um, would be motor cortex, because they're moving all over the place, compared to being restricted to a smaller region. And I do want to say, we started off using Sprague Dolly. We're going to start using Norwegian brown rats. Um, but the reason we started off using these is because, remember how I told you we, catch, we caught our wild-caught rats and wild-caught squirrels? They are really, really nasty. Uh, the mean, mean. I mean, squirrels are meaner, but, but rats are pretty mean, too. And so, <laughs> like, I would know this, right? I'm like the only person in this whole room, probably in this whole country, who knows the difference, like, that, like, that wild squirrels are really mean and so are wild rats compared to laboratory animals. But, so anyway, we wanted to start with a rat, um, a rat um, breed that we knew was docile and nice because we handled them every day. Um, and so it was these guys. But I just want to show you some of the sorts of things that they're doing in this cage, right? They're all over the place. You, you, normal rat doesn't have access to anything like this. And what we found, each one of these sites is an intracortical uh, a site where we did intracortical microstimulation in motor cortex and somatosensory cortex. And these are just the different body parts. And so what we see is that these, the semi-naturally reared animals had a smaller vibrissi, rep vibrissi representation or the portions of the snout that move the vibrissi, somewhat smaller forelimb representation, but they had a really large hind limb representation. Um, and it's, I, don't, I didn't show in this particular animal, they, sent, they also have a tail representation. And so you don't see, you don't see even ever see a tail representation in normal um, laboratory reared rats. Um, so literally, laboratory rats have become truncate, truncated. They're, they're this, they're just not really using their hind limbs. But I think what's more telling is this um, illustration that Dylan made. So this is laboratory is the gray and field pen is the green. And what I really want to focus you on is combined forelimb and hind limb movements versus combined whisker and forelimb movements. So that when we stimulate it, we evoked a movement of hind limbs and forelimb together versus um, hand and whisker together. And what we see is that in our, laboratory, in our field pen animals, we have um, a large percentage of cortex that devote, that's devoted to representing forelimb and hind limb movements. And in our uh, laboratory animals, we have a large portion of cortex that's devoted to representing combined whisker and forelimb movements. So we've changed the phenotype pretty dramatically. We also looked at, this is with Danielle Stolzenberg, we're looking at genes that are involved in um, altering the transcription of, of I'm sorry, uh, epigenetic marks that are involved in regulating the, the transcription of genes that are involved in cortical development. And we do little punches in different portions of the cortex. And this happens to be an S1. And what we found in the field pen rats that we have an increase in HDAC expression. Um, and this is sort of what HDAC is, is thought to do. Um, strength of, um, it regulates the strength of excitatory st synapses. Um, OK, so alterations. So this is now, we went from let's, let's remove the eyes and radically change the ratio of incoming sensory inputs um, to we're going to catch these wild animals. And this is more subtle. We're going to radically change the environment, because this is a radical change in the environment. I showed you the enriched stuff with monodelphus, but this is, this is much more radical than that. Um, so it, it, it alters um, cortical phenotype. It alters developmental trajectories. And it, all, it, it appears to alter the underlying mechanisms, including epigenetic marks, which regula regulate gene transcription. But this is the really, really big question, in my op opinion. Can rearing in a highly vi uh, variable environment alter the, the ability of the animal to meet novel challenges? Because right? if you think about a laboratory setting, lights are on and off at the same time every day. They get fed the same time every day. They get their ch cage changed once a week. There is no variability in the, in the physical parameters of their environment, and, and, and even in the space in which they move. So, so if, if there are, I think you know, we're, it's going to be more that we're going to, of course, we're going to see these phenotypic changes. Um, but it's probably going to be at the level of the synapse that we're going to see, um, is the animal, is the, is the brain more plastic throughout a lifetime? And one of the, the reason we developed that ladder rung task was for that, this very thing. So what, what can I have a, a laboratory rat do and a field pen rat do that would represent a novel environmental challenge? And, and can they learn it more rapidly or they, can they do it better? Okay, so now I'm just about done with my talk. And now I want to talk about something much, much more subtle. And this is natural differences in rearing conditions. And 
Um, I'm doing this in conjunction with Karen Bales and Danielle Stolzenberg, and we're looking at prairie voles. And so I don't know if you guys know about prairie voles. <laughs> it's like I, I, every thought, do you guys know anything about uh, duckbill platypus? No. What, where, are you, where have you guys been? Okay, so let me tell you about uh, prairie voles. Prairie voles are monogamous. They're one of the few mammalian species that are monogamous, and they're biparental. So both the, the male and the female rear the young. And the other cool thing about, about um, prairie voles, but this is true of, of many animals, um, their, their rearing behavior <laughs> falls under a normal distribution. It's like anything in biology. And in this instance, I want to talk about amount of tactile contact. So there are some prairie voles that have a lot of contact with their young, physical tactile contact with their young, and there are some prairie voles that have less physical co contact with their young. And of course, then there's that middle of the distribution that has you know, a moderate amount of tactile contact with their young. What's really cool, and by contact, it could be huddling contact, um, non-huddling contact, neutral, for this is the mom, neutral nursing, lateral nursing. You can do this for both the mother and the father. And what you, what you find is that there are significant differences in the amount of tactile contact that the parents have with their young. I like it because you can quantify it. Um, high and low contact off, offspring exhibit differences in social behaviors as juveniles. And remember, high, high contact isn't better and low contact isn't worse. There is nothing good, oh, there is nothing absolutely good or, or wrong in the course of evolution or in, or, or in anything. Um, it's just, th this is just something that happens, at the, the differences in tactile contact. This is really important. High contact babies become high contact parents and low contact babies become low contact parents. And if you cross foster them, so if you take the high contact baby on P0 and you put it with a low contact parent, it becomes a low contact parent. So it becomes what its fostered parent is, not what its biological parent is. So this is social transmission of a parental rearing style that we can measure. OK. So we just started, well, it's still in progress. The reason we were interested in this portion of the uh, body of the, of the prairie vole, I don't know if you noticed on, in that first picture, they actually have a lot of specialized perial um, hairs. They even have hairs on their upper palate. And most of the contact is happening in and around here. We're also going to look at the olfactory system. And if we look at the S1, primary somatosensory cortex, and we look at the region of S1 devoted to processing inputs from this region of the face, it's much larger and high versus low. And I don't think that's really surprising. Adele Selke, who was a postdoc in my laboratory, did a really beautiful study where she injected this perioral representation with a neuroanatomical tracer, and then she quantified the projections of this region um, in, in high contact and low contact animals. And this is, these are just injection sites, and these are back, this is what the back labeled cells look, look like. And these back, these are, would be the back labeled cells in illustration form. So this is high contact, here's an injection in the perioral mouth representation. Here's low contact, perioral mouth representation. And overall, things look fairly similar. But you'll notice that there are some differences in density of connections, and certainly in FM and, and this region, um, uh, S2PV. This is, these are contralateral connections. Um, things are relatively similar, but we're seeing differences in density in M1, and actually the presence of novel connections that we don't see in normal animals. And you can quantify this, and this is similar to the quantification that I showed you in a, the previous study. If, if they were both the same, they would all hover around this line right here. This is um, low contact, high contact. So for example, if I'm looking at M1, um, low contact animals have about 10% more connections from M1 to S1 than do um, high contact animals, and so I'll let you interpret that. So, so these are subtle changes. So I went from let's take a sledgehammer to the system to let's look, just look at natural, natural variation within an individual population. And so we can't consider, I'm, I'm sort of summarizing now, we can't consider uh, cortical evolution or phenotypic changes across species without, appreciate, without appreciating within life changes as well. So, so and the, are these developmental studies allow us to appreciate how phenotypic transformations occur and underscore the importance of context. And so I call it an evolutionary masquerade because it's really hard to know um, if, if, if these contextual um, or environmental conditions persist for tens of thousands to millions of years, then that phenotype is going to persist, right? Um, and if they don't, that phenotype goes away. So um, what factors contribute to a cortical phenotype? And my, the, the title of my talk used to be, How Does Evolution Build a Complex Brain? 
But that's too limiting because evolution is about, um, is about DNA sequence. Um, this is about phenotype, and a phenotype is a combination of, of genes and environment. And so, of course, I said genes. I gave you some examples. Genes, there are, people have worked out the alterations in cell cycle kinetics. They're involved in expansion of the cortical sheet. Genes can control cortical field size. They can control um, cortical connections, peripheral morphology. Really important. Genes, can, this may be under genetic control, and I suspect it is. Cellular mechanisms involved in plasticity. So it's not the particular phenotype, but these mechanisms that allow the environment to have an impact on cortical phenotype, which can affect some of the same things. So I have cortical field size, cortical connections, peripheral morphology. So when I was first starting out, I would think of what is the way in which connections change? What is the way in which we, we can increase the size of a cortical field? What is the way in which we can do anything in evolution? And there isn't a way. It's going to be, it's going to be combinatorial, some, so, you know, between genes and environment. Um, and it's it, the way in which a squirrel changes connections of V1 may not be quite the same way that humans have changed connections of V1. And I've given you examples of Bill of the Platypus, the tongue larynx lips of a human as specializations. Um, but what about things like social learning, language, and culture? And, and these are the things that humans are interested in. And what I would contend is that these are simply complex patterns of physical stimuli that are impinging on the developing nervous system and, and, and altering how that nervous system unravels, right? So, it's not, it's not useful to talk about you know, maternal care and love um, in rearing an individual. What you want to talk about, what is love in terms of maternal care? It's, it's tactile contact, it's temperature, it's cadence of a voice. Um, that's it, that's, that's all our brain has access to, right? That's it. Um, so I think, I think it's really fruitful to, to, to think of more complex human constructs in this, in this way. And so this is just a little um, history of humans. And at the top are, alterations in peripheral morphology um, and, or, and or genes. And the bottom is social and environmental context. And, and this is just to illustrate a point. Features of the modern hand were, have been around for about 3.2 million years, only had control of fire for maybe a million years. The modern hand and the modern hyoid, the hyoid is the portion of the superlaryngeal tract that's involved in speech, they've been around for 700,000 years. Um, we, we weren't doing with the hand 700,000 years ago what we're doing with the hand now. Um, and, and, you know, when speech or language evolved, I, it's, it's, it's contentious, but most would say probably not as long as 700,000 years ago. So this has now changed. It might be 300,000 years ago. Whether it's 200 or 300, it's not really different for this particular part of the talk. Earliest anatomically modern humans have been around for 200,000 years. And it was only about 300,000 years ago we were still using spears and knives. And then about 70,000 years ago, we were using these polished blades uh, um, and, and flint, flint rocks. Industrial revolution occurred 300 years ago. That's, when you really think about it, that's, it's really quite remarkable. And now we have daily and prolonged interactions with computers and machines. The point is, is that culture has snowballed. If you believe that all behavior is generated by the brain, and I believe that all behavior is generated by the brain, then the brain must have changed. But no changes in, in no, no, no sort of traditional evolutionary ways has the brain changed. It has to be changing via these contextual or epigenetic mechanisms um, that allow the, the, the individual to interface really beautifully um, with, its, with its environment. And so then I would argue that if, we're, if we really wanted to say what's different about the human brain versus other animal brains, I would say that we've evolved the capacity to recreate our cortical phenotype over successive generations. We can change our connectivity. So Leah Krubitzer would not be the same Leah Krubitzer if I were born 200,000 years ago. I would not be the same if I were born 20 years ago. I wouldn't be the same if I were born in Africa. I wouldn't be the same if I were born after my sister, after my sister Lori, who's my youngest sister. Right? I, I, I would be a, different, I'd be a different brain. Maybe subtly different, but still different. Um, this allows the, the brain to develop cortical networks that match the physical and social statistics of the environment in which it develops and generate flexible behavior repertoire to meet the rapidly changing social um, circumstances. And, I, and then this is just sort of an aside, but this is why it's really hard for us, it was hard for us as kids to understand our parents and it's hard, or it's hard, it is hard for our, our kids to understand us because we're doing it through a, a different brain. And certainly, given the snowball um, of, of the use of machines in modern culture, the use of social media, I would say that impacts, that, that, that's really had an impact on, on how those 
young brains are developing, um, making them quite different than, than my brain. Um, okay, I guess this is my laboratory, and that's it. Well, that's fantastic, Leah. Thank you very much. Okay. Do I still have the same brain now after your talk? Or? No, actually, that's what I was going to say. I mean, we, ha we, we can't also forget. <laughs> <laughs> I am such high maintenance. I'm probably going to let the yeah. yeah. let yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. You know, what I was going to say is you have to remember, and I'm, I'm talking about these, this developmental plasticity, but my brain isn't the same now or now or now, right? You have all these small synaptic changes occurring constantly um, that allows us, that allows sort of um, new combinations of, of, exist, of hard, hardwired networks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, other questions yeah. for Leah? I know I'm going to stand away from there because I'm going to electrocute myself. <laughs> Uh, I'm called Jonathan Th Thompson. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk, uh, which was very interesting. And uh, I just had a question about uh, this idea of uh, epigenetic changes, because uh, this is not at all an area I'm an expert in, but I, I, I know of some work where uh, some people have demonstrated that, for instance, if you uh, stroke some rats regularly, they, they develop very differently compared to the ones that are deprived of contact while, they're, while, while they grow up. Uh, and that those differences in behavior, say, uh, how they, their stress, how they react to stressful situations, for, exa for example, uh, can get passed down through generations, right? So they persist over like five, six generations. And I was just wondering if that's something you've looked at, if that's something you've seen. So here's the deal. Um, that, that was the, the work, the licking and grooming. Is that what you're talking about? By Michael Meany. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and, and Francis, I can't remember her last name. Right. So my understanding is that it, it doesn't last for five generations. It can last for three generations. So you, you can be the mom, a, pr a pregnant mom, her offspring, and then her offspring's offspring. And if it goes beyond, it, 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 my understanding is it doesn't go beyond three generations. There are a couple of things they found that have gone beyond three or four generations, which suggests it's getting somehow incorporated into the genome, which is the big million dollar question, right? Because ultimately, there are evolutionary changes, right? So, so how, do, how do these sorts of changes, or, or do they, relate to the you know, changes that, that get encoded in the genome and get passed on? Tony? Uh, Leah, the, um, the study with the voles, um, the, can you put the slide back up for the... Uh... Yeah. Which one? Um, just keep going back. I'll tell you when to stop. I, you know what? That was during my, I learned how to use animation on my PowerPoint period, <laughs> and I went a little crazy. OK, here, yeah, this is good. So um, I, I'm just surprised that uh, the contrast, so high contact and low contact, you, you would kind of think maybe it would be the other way around, because I, the high contact doesn't seem to have as much connections. So right. The, the first thing we thought was we would expect to see more global processing in high context versus low context, but we don't. I mean, this is, this is what we see. I mean, we can... We, but it's counterintuitive, right? It's counterintuitive, but it's the data. I know, but, yeah, I mean, but have you got a speculation about, about why? Yeah, they're inhibitory. <laughs> <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> no, but remember, you know, all these studies on enriched environments, right? You're going to have more, but right. but why do we think? I mean, I, yeah, but I mean, why would you need more? It, it, why would it enrich be more? Why couldn't it enrich be? Scott made a good point. It could be more, but they could be inhibitory. Why why can't it be more local processing? Um, which one's better, more global processing or local processing? You know, I mean, so so with our data, it was sort of like when we I showed you the differences in the behavioral stuff where our normal animals didn't change their when we cut their whiskers, it didn't change their tactile discrimination abilities, even though it looks like they whisk a lot. Um, so, you know, when Deepa first brought me that, I said, well, you know, that's the data. I, you can, and so I would speculate, for whatever reason, low contact generates more broadly distributed connections. I, and what those connections are actually doing, um, how they're helping the animal, we didn't look at. So if you're looking at motor cortex, contralateral motor cortex and ipsilateral motor cortex, the next thing you might want to do is look at, well, are there differences in their beha you know, mo motoric behavior? And it might be good to actually look at, do some intracortical microstimulation in these guys and look at their, their maps to see exactly what that means. Because you can also say, 
in a normal, okay, so I, I, I can speculate widely. I just thought of something, right? So here's me speculating widely. Well, if you're low contact, you can see that in certain instances that would be good because in a normal population, maybe they're out foraging more for food, right? I mean, so then we know from our wild population of rats that they have changes in motor cortex or semi-natural semi rats. So maybe that's what those connections are for. I, you know, I, I don't know, Tone. Uh, well, first, a uh, small insight in this uh, precise topic. Uh, I remember a journal club, I think, that uh, Maria gave it, uh, so we could look for the paper, but they were showing that uh, kids born uh, before the nine-month period were showing uh, diminished, uh, diminished um, I think, thalamocortical connections and increased uh, connectivity within the somatosen um, somatosensory and motor uh, mm. cortices of the lips, especially of the representation of the lips, because where they should be developing uh, some other connections, because they were born first, the, uh, before of their time, they had to develop the, um, the leaking movements. Right, right. And, they, and just the fact of, potentially, just the fact of uh, having to, to suck uh, and get the food uh, made uh, that the plasticity was directed to, towards oh, more cool. useful movements than others. In this case, they could be just uh, strongly developing uh, the, se the sensory information and motor information for high contact, uh, whether the other have more space to explore or to develop other kind of connections, just as, a, as, yeah, a, as an yeah, insight. Uh, um, whose paper, who, who asked that? Uh, I will look for it. We, we will look for it and we, and we send it to you. Uh, and then I had a question about uh, so you highlighted in the rats gone wild uh, experiments uh, the fact that they were developing. Um, uh, so you highlighted specifically the figure where you had uh, hind, uh, no, four limbs and whiskers uh, developed in one case and four limb and uh, hind limb in the other. And uh, after that, you said that the big question is to see whether one case uh, increases the plasticity, extends the period of plasticity for a longer time. And uh, I guess you cannot give too much of a teaser now, but I would like to know uh, your opinion on what do you think that would be the impacts of a negative result uh, in that. So if you don't have an extended period of plasticity, what would you think uh, that would, so how do you think this would affect the way we educate? Because the way we, we, we educate would have would shape exactly how the people will be in the future and would a bit uh, reduce this notion of free will and responsibility that was being told uh, in the previous talk. Yeah, well, I mean, so if we got a negative result on our rats, um, and th that's assuming that we can even tap that. I mean, that's what we thought the l ladder rung is going to do, but uh, we have to think through that more clearly. Um, I would still be okay with that because a rat isn't a human. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, that humans don't have an ex extended period of plasticity if they're reared in a, in a, in a variable environment. And we are reared in a fairly variable environment. Um, so your question on education, I'm not quite certain how that fits in, but I do agree that you know, we've decided as a, as a community how we want young brains to develop, right? I mean, it, it, we, we do this all the time. It's called socialization, right? We, 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 we can have young brains that develop with the concept of religion or without, we have young brains that we, we decided as a culture we want young brains to know how to read. I mean, we are. This is this is a perfect example of what culture really is. It's groups of brains, you know, driving the development of future young brains. But it's not just the content; it's also the method that matters. Oh, the method. In the sense that we have uh, kids in cages or classes staring at a right. teacher for a long time right, right. I, with I, respect to having the kids just no, no, no. interacting with the world oh, I, I got, the I got same you. topics I got you. but in a, different, well, you know in a completely what? different way. So, so uh, th this is a really good question. I was at a meeting not that long ago. It was on the role of play and um, in, 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 in development. And it turns out th there was a woman, I'm terrible with names, she's at NYU. It was, it, it was an incredible piece of information that when a kid is like two or three, she put this like moving, she had a little attachment on his head so she could see how many steps he takes and how often he gets up and sits down. It was incredible, like in a day, not like walking simultaneously, like all at once, like the length of three football fields, 
right? Like a two-year-old. And so we had this, it was a bunch of discussions and that was exactly the idea um, that, that kids need to play, right? That's part of normal brain development. And what do we do? Like not even in kindergarten, but in preschool, they are bound. Like we cage them, we make them sit at a desk and we bind them. And then everybody has ADD. <laughs> we, we, we're trying to figure that out when it's called, I'm a normal kid and I don't want to sit, sit at a desk. This is the question you're getting at, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we really need to, to think about this because I don't know what it's like in Europe, but in the United States, you have to like sign up before your kid's even born to get into a preschool when the kid is six months old. Then, you know, it is a really restricted environment compared to what I grew up in, for example. Well, you can't put them in the cardboard box at home, no? It's just the same deal. <laughs> idea of masquerading as, as evolution, right? Because also there on the slide, it says it could masquerade for a thousand years. It's unbelievable, a, 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 a high number, right? So when we think of the phenotype, I think this is the, the, a better answer to this. Let's not even talk about brain tissue and brain organization. But this was something that struck me. I read this paper years ago, um, that diet can affect orofacial development and bone structure. Gravitational stress can affect bone density. So if I'm a paleontologist um, and, and I'm looking at bones and I see a certain bone type, to what extent is that like traditionally evolutionarily driven versus simply the diet that somebody's eating? So that's what I mean by masquerade. You know, so the, the differences in these skulls, one could be masquerading as a true evolutionary change and there aren't really, you know, what do they have now, 50 species of humans or whatever. So you right. kind of get it. No, but, but, but what's interesting about that is that you still have some sort of dualism in that argument. Isn't the point much more that these factors are continuously oh, oh, working oh, together? Oh, absolutely. Yes, right? yes. But, but, you know, I think I, I, maybe, I, maybe I should rephrase it. I mean, right now, or we have been for a long past six or seven years, we're so gene-centric. We thought that we're going to do, if we do comparative mm -hmm. genomics, we're going to understand what makes humans human. And we, it's, it's all about the genes. And so I'm... Okay, I, I'm not right. arguing against genes, and I'm not trying to make it dual, but I'm saying it's complicated. It's complicated, Maude. Right. They're ins, they're outs. Have you ever seen The Big Lebowski? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, when I showed you, I said, here are, the things that, here are the things that genes can change, and here are the things that the environment can change, and some of them were the same thing. Mm -hmm. And all I'm saying, it's combinatorial. Um, but not, it doesn't have to be the same combination for every species, or even, um, I think, within a species. Through, right. You know, right, right? So I, I understand. that's yeah. uh, definitely. We're on the same page. One question in the back here. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I can see on the last slide that you are working with stroke patients. No? Your laboratory is working with stroke oh, patients. Oh, no, no, I'm not working with stroke. I, I'm funded by um, the National Institute of, uh, what is it, NINDS, Neurological Disease and Stroke. Okay. But how do you think that this kind of work could help uh, stroke recovery? Um, there must already run. I mean, depending on when the stroke is, if you had a stroke very early in development, obviously, we already know this, you know, the prognosis is better. Um, you know, if, if environment can alter connections in a developing organism, then I would say if you have any kind of brain trauma when you're younger, um, then you're, you know, you're, I guess I can think about some sort of therapies that might help based on this, but when you're older, you know, people do recover from stroke, but it's not because they're growing new connections. It's because they're reactivating networks in a different, uh, in a different way, right? You're not growing new tissue back. So, so how you can enhance that process, um, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. You're more of an expert than I am in terms of the stroke. The stroke well, what's I think. interesting is that there are some groups who are running big clinical trials now with this idea that after stroke, you fall back into a motor babbling phase, which I think is extremely naive, OK? So that they really believe that, that sort of you can bring the brain back in, of, let's say, an elderly person into this stage of, of, of a brain that is sort of three, four years old. And I don't think that's really the case. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so if, if we don't talk, yeah, if we don't talk about language, and let's just talk about manual dexterity, because we're planning some of these experiments. Um, one would think that if you, you know, I think there are some studies too, forced use. Um, is a really good thing to do for recovery of a limb after stroke, for example. Right? You, you, make, you make the individual use the affected side. Is that not true? I, th I think it's true in monkeys. Well, there was just a big study came out uh, last year by Carter and others that did a really systematic evaluation of this constraint loop movement therapy, and it doesn't work. 
really. Yeah, yeah. I Trust work is, is um, intention enhanced error reduction. That's something that right, because, uh, because, because I thought, you know, Randy Nudo's been doing some of this for a while, and there are other people doing it in Monkey. I know. You know this, where, where yeah, really. Monkey has some evidence for that, but now in really a big clinical trial. Really? That really widely so, what do you, so what do you do? Well, that, so I was recently at a, at a rather important conference on neurorehabilitation, and people were getting really depressed because they didn't know what to do anymore. But the one thing <laughs> that really does work, the one thing that does work is um, the kind of rehabilitation methods we have been using using virtual reality, where you would use visual error feedback. So you could, in that case, give people a, a reduced, and also we talked about it earlier, a reduced sense of error, which then helps the learning system to sort of recover and re-engage with that limb. There's not very much sprouting. I mean, there's some people have shown sprouting after spinal cord injury a little bit in the brainstem, but in the cord, and I think Nuno may have shown a little bit of sprouting after motor cortex lesions. It's reorganization. It's reorganization. So, you know, but, but the degrees of freedom for, freedom for changing a network are huge, right? If you think of all the synapses in the cortex and you, could, you can change the weighting of them, you could, you could do a lot. Right. That's what we've shown in about 25 uh, chronic patients. Uh, with the system we, we've been developing, is that you have a reorganization of the, the motor cortex. So you, you see the, the acute stimulation current of GMS, the sensor it moves, and you also see enhanced innervation of hand muscles again. So it's really reorganization and not necessarily that you sort of sprout new cells. It's more you, you use hardware that's there to reorganize. So Belen will be presenting this work uh, next Thursday. Okay. So okay. just that uh, you will. And there is one more. Very last question here. Very last. Good job. Okay. Hello. Uh, so you, you have shown that uh, genotype and experience both affect phenotype. But do we know if there is another pathway that could be that, for example, experience has some influence on the genes themselves within the lifetime of an individual? For example, by switching on or off some genes that could then affect phenotypes as well. Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of the newer work with these epigenetic, epigenetic markers have, have been demonstrating. That, so you can, things like histone acetylation and uh, DNA, D DNA methylation, um, and I'm not a molecular biologist, but they can change the expression patterns of genes that are involved in development of connection or axon fasciculation or those sorts of things. Yeah, so, so there, there are these underlying mechanisms. It's not just this kind of happening. They're, they're affecting the normal gene networks. And they're just altering them, yes. Yeah. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. You know, should we, should we, um,